One way that we can characterize a programming language is by the memory management technique that the programmer employs when using it. There are three primary techniques, manual memory management, garbage collection, and reference counting. In this episode, we'll explain all three. Welcome to Copec Explained Software, the podcast where we make computing intelligible. In this episode, we're going to be discussing memory management from the programmer's perspective, not the operating systems, not the runtimes, but as a programmer using a particular language, what technique do you employ to allocate memory and to deallocate memory? Managing memory is a really important part of programming. It's one of the ways or one of the most important ways for managing performance. Is that right? Yeah, and there's two things we think about mainly with performance. One is CPU time. How much of the CPU cycles does our program utilize as it runs? And the other is memory consumption. How much of the system's RAM is our program using as it executes? Memory consumption is highly tied to the technique that's used for allocating and deallocating memory. Some programming languages inherently use more memory because of the memory management technique that they employ. And some programming languages allow for some performance boons thanks to their memory management paradigm. Let's start with the most basic, manual memory management. That'll give us something to compare the others to. Yeah, and I think for each of them, I also want to mention an emblematic programming language. So when I think about manual memory management, the most emblematic language of that paradigm for me is C. In C, local variables are automatically allocated on the stack. and You don't really need to think about them too much. But when you want to have long running chunks of memory that are dynamically allocated, use a standard library functions malloc and calloc, as well as to remove that memory, the standard library function free. In other words, any time in C that you need a big chunk of dynamically allocated memory, you have to manually go and say, this is the amount of memory that I want. And when you're done using that memory, you have to remember to free it to say, I'm done using this memory chunk and other programs are free to now take over that section of memory. This is a lot of bookkeeping on the part of the programmer. It gives the programmer a lot of fine grained control, but can also lead to errors because the programmer might make bookkeeping errors. For example, one type of error is a memory leak. The programmer allocates some memory and they forget to free it. If the program is long running and continually leaking memory, this can be a big problem. It can start to take up a lot of the system's total memory. Another memory problem that can result from bookkeeping errors is a double free error. This is you freed some memory and then you thought that you hadn't freed it, so you go and you free it again. But by the time you free it the second time, it's possible that something else was actually in that section of memory and now you've just deleted memory that you shouldn't have been deleting. Finally, a third kind of bookkeeping error that's pretty common is what's called a dangling pointer. This is a pointer to a section of memory that you've already freed, but then you try accessing after you freed it because you didn't realize that you freed it. We're all human, and if we're programming in a language of manual memory management, if we write enough lines of code, we're bound to make one of these errors. Now, there are programs like Valgrind that can help us get to the bottom of these errors, finding them, where they're coming from, and fixing them. And debuggers can help us too. But there are programming languages that don't use manual memory management, actually the majority of languages today, and therefore are immune to a lot of these programmer errors. On the other hand, a manual memory managed language gives the programmer incredibly fine-grained control with almost no overhead the programmer is able to specifically say, this is the exact amount of memory I need, and this is exactly how long I need it, because they specify when they free it. So for very performance intensive applications, manual memory management is still the preferred paradigm. Something like a game, for example, or a very high performance scientific application. Another type of memory management is garbage collection. This one isn't manual. How does it work? Yeah, it's actually a surprisingly old technique. Garbage collection goes all the way back to the invention of Lisp in the late 1950s. In garbage collection, at least classic garbage collection, using what's called a, a tracing collector, the programming language's runtime keeps track 
of every allocation of memory. So you create a new variable, uh, some memory is allocated automatically for you by the language runtime. And when the runtime realizes that nothing is any longer referencing that area of memory, it automatically frees that area of memory. The downside of this, this sounds great, right? This eliminates a lot of these bookkeeping errors that we were just talking about from manual memory management. But there is some overhead in running the garbage collector. One of the bits of overhead is that it itself actually requires a certain amount of memory. So a garbage collected language, a program written in it that was also written in a manually memory managed language will tend to take up more total memory as it's running because the garbage collector itself and tagging each section of memory to be collected by the garbage collector takes up additional memory. And then the other downside is that actually there can be a performance hit when the collection happens. That actually, of course, takes up some CPU cycles doing that collection, going around and looking, hey, is this part of memory still being used? Is anything referencing it? Collectors have gotten a lot better over the last decade, but there still is a performance hit. So garbage collection eliminates a whole host of programmer errors, but at the same time has a performance downside, both in terms of memory consumption and CPU usage. And what's a programming language that uses it? One of the most quintessential garbage collected languages is Java. And I mentioned Java for a couple of reasons. One is it's one of the most popular programming languages in the world. And one of the big things that it brought about when it came out in 1995 was it was a replacement for C++ for many programmers that was garbage collected. C++ up to that point was generally used as a manually memory managed language, although there are garbage collectors for C++ and there is what we're going to call reference counting in a few minutes for C++ as well. But it's the dominant paradigm in C++ programming is manual memory management uh, using the new and delete keywords. Java came about as kind of a C++++ with a built-in garbage collector. And that was one of the big reasons that it was a much safer language than C++ when it came out in 1995. The other reason I mentioned Java is that Java, um, at least the mainline implementation of Java from Oracle, has greatly improved its garbage collector throughout the lifetime of the language. Early versions of Java could have some pretty long pauses as the garbage collector went around looking for what areas of memory can be freed. Modern versions of Java don't have such a performance hit from garbage collector pauses. So it's a great example of how the technology of garbage collection has really improved over time. And then we have reference counting. What's that? Yeah, reference counting is a little weird and more foreign to, to people who might already be familiar with the other two paradigms because it's a lot less common. There are fewer languages that employ reference counting. The idea with reference counting is each object, if it's, let's say, an object-oriented programming language, has what's called a reference count. That is how many parts of the program or how many other objects are referencing it at any given time. So, for example, if the reference count is two, that means two different parts of the program, two other parts of the program are referencing that object at this time. When a part of the program is done using that object, it can decrease the count. And when we want to increase the count, we generally call that a retain call. And when we want to decrease the count, we generally call that a release call. So when the number of releases decreases the reference count down to zero, then the object is freed. It's deallocated. The memory is free for some other part of the program or another program altogether to use. So this is kind of like halfway between the two. There is this extra bookkeeping going on of keeping track of the reference count, but we're not having to manually decide exactly when to deallocate. We just have to decide when we're no longer using that object and therefore can decrease the count. So it's kind of like a halfway between manual memory management and garbage collection. It has some of the pros and cons of both of them. For example, there is some extra memory consumption compared to manual memory management because every object has to be tagged with its reference count. And there is some CPU performance hit because there's all of these extra retain and release calls, upping and downing the reference count of each object. On the other hand, um, there is a decrease in some amount of programmer errors because this count is helping to do a bunch of the bookkeeping. Now, it might not sound that good to you compared to garbage collection, but there's a newer version of reference counting called automatic reference counting. 
in automatic reference counting, the compiler actually goes and inserts all of the retain and release calls. A quintessential reference counted language is Objective-C. And I learned to program Objective-C back in 2001. And I remember having retain and release calls. And there's another call called auto release all over my Objective-C code. Then in the mid 2010s, Apple, who's kind of the steward of Objective-C, introduced automatic reference counting. And with automatic reference counting, all of those retain and release calls were automatically inserted by the compiler. So the programmer no longer had to think about where to increase the retain counts or uh, where to call release. And it actually started to feel like using a garbage collected language with one caveat, which is something called a cycle. If you have two objects that are both referencing one another, each of them will be keeping the reference count above zero because each of them is keeping the reference count at at least one, right? And so those pieces of memory might leak and then never be released. And so you have to be mindful about cycles if you're programming in a reference counted language and reference counted languages like Objective-C have a way of marking one of the references as saying, for this reference, don't increase the reference count. And so you have to realize when a cycle might happen and usually the keyword for that is weak and you have to mark one of those references as weak. So, but automatic reference counting in practice is really thought about almost as another kind of garbage collection. And it tends to be more performant than traditional garbage collection. Is memory management something a programmer should think about when they're deciding what language to use? Yes. Um, and I think the big trade-off that you need to make is between performance and safety. In a garbage collected language, you're eliminating a whole host of potential programmer errors, but there is a small performance penalty that comes with that. And that small performance penalty can be bigger depending on your particular type of application, which even to this day is why manual memory management tends to be used in very high performance applications like games. And C++, typically used as a manually memory managed language, is still the mainstay for game programming, partially for this reason, because they need to squeeze out every last bit of performance and having that fine grained control of memory management gives them that last little bit of performance. Thanks for listening to us this week. Rebecca, how can people get in touch with us on Twitter? We're at Kopec Explains, K-O-P-E-C-E-X-P-L-A-I-N-S. If you have ideas for topics on the show, feel free to tweet at us and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye.